Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrubin. Sarah Luria is executive director and creator of Beloved, a network of spiritual leaders who are planting new projects and communities. Sarah spent four years as spiritual leader of Beloved Brooklyn, which you should look up. It's incredible and it's still going on. Prior to Beloved, Sarah was the founder and executive director of Immerse NYC, a community mikva project, which is now part of the JCC Manhattan. Sarah recently moved from Brooklyn, New York to Northampton, Massachusetts with her husband, three kids and their pandemic puppy. Welcome Sarah to the broadcast. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. So Beloved, I love the name, first of all, of your organizations, I should say. I don't even know if you call them organizations. because Yeah, we do. Okay. So if you can just start by defining it for those who've never heard of it and don't know it exists. Great. Okay. So Beloved, we are now calling Beloved Garden, is our national organization. And uh, what we do is we support spiritual leaders who are the way we put it, creating new spaces of sacred belonging. So spiritual leaders of all stripes and all denominations and non-denominational who are going out on their own, they're independent, they're creative, and they need a lot of nourishment and support to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves so they can have the energy and the koach and the strength to go and build Uh, what they're building. And so that's what we do here at Beloved is we, um, one of the ways we think about it is we help our leaders feel beloved so that they can in turn serve those who they are trying to serve and help them feel beloved. And why is it important that our leaders feel beloved? Well, I think we're living through a transition. I mean, I'm not The first person, and I will not be the last person to say, we are living through a transition in Jewish life in America. And I think that those who are on, um, some might say the front lines, but I would say in the cracks between what was and what will be, let's say that, those people who are kind of on the edge um, and trying to think through like, you know, both what do they need as spiritual leaders and what do the the people who they see around them who are who are interested in becoming more engaged with their Jewish life but don't know how? Those leaders um, are kind of building as they creating the plane as they're building it, or what's the word flying the plane as they're building it? You know that oh, kind yes. of thing. Um, and so they're out there. A lot of them, most of them, if not all of them, on their own. Um, and a lot of them say to us. Uh, how do I know if I'm doing well? <laughs> you know, what are the metrics? How do I measure this? You know, yes, we we have a lot of humans coming, but what are other ways I know? Am I on the right track? Am I am I doing well? Is this where I should be in year two? And so what we do is we try to support them to say, you know, keep going. Nobody knows the answers, but and keep they going. Could be, just, just so I'm clear, sir, they could they could have a pulpit correct? And, and come to beloved, or is this all kind of, they've created a spiritual community and then they're turning to you for kind of growth and nourishment. It's people who are creating something from scratch. Okay. Yes. It's creating new spaces um, of sacred belonging. So it's from scratch and um, as much as anything, as it, yes. There could be disparate. If you have 12 in a cohort, they are all doing their own sort of they they all have their own path and their own their own building blocks for what they're making yeah but but beloved is helping them basically figure it out yeah and not only are we helping them figure it out we do kind of two discrete pieces of that one is we put them in a cohort like you said with other people who are figuring it out and even though they're not in the same city doing the same project there is a lot of value to being with someone else that is like, I don't know what I'm doing. Do you know what you're doing? <laughs> or I'm trying this thing today. Are you trying this thing today? You know, can you help me? Can you help me think this through? Um, so that's one piece. And then the other piece is um, what I like to think of as less sexy and maybe even more necessary, which is we um, do fiscal sponsorship for organizations, for these organizations. And we do a lot of 
support on the back end. So not only are we helping them with their banking and their bookkeeping and their accounting, but we're also helping with really other boring things like insurance. Like who would think like, do clergy think about insurance for gatherings? No, but we do. And so, right. um, and only because, and this might be anticipating another question you have, I like to say that because I've, this is my third organization and only because I've done it a couple of times and messed up many things a couple of times that I kind of have a little bit more of a pulse on, oh, what might someone need if they were just starting out and they were a spiritual leader and they really didn't know anything about running an organization because that was me. Um, so let's just step back 10,000 feet or step up sure. and, and look at what you were talking about as this inflection point for the for Jewish life, which I couldn't agree more. And we obviously have many friends who talk about this in smart ways as you do. But for those who just kind of aren't necessarily in the trenches of watching this transition happen, yeah. is it particularly amped up by the post COVID moment? Is it about people not finding belonging or meaning in synagogues and JCCs and federations and the, and sort of the old guard, which for many people is still extremely resonant and connecting and for a lot of people feels kind of antiquated and leaves them cold. Like what, how would you explain, and I know DIY is to do it yourself is maybe is to flip, but why are so many people creating new things? Right, right, right. I, I want to um, answer, I want to answer it a little bit micro and then I'll get to the macro, which is our hope is not um, that there's, a million new things on top of a million things that exist, right? Like what my hope, and you know this from Immerse NYC, which was the first project I I create, I founded and, and worked on, is that Immerse NYC, which was a, a brand new project in 2013. Just say more, just in one sentence what it is for those who It's a know. community mikvah project. So uh, we support people who are having transitions to immerse in the mikvah as a way to honor that transition Jewishly. Um, and so, uh, but Immerse NYC, which was started in a, you know, basically in a Starbucks, when people used to hang out in Starbucks, because now that's less cool, but back in 2013. Although you were not, I, I want to just say, because I went there and it was extraordinary. It's not like you were immersing in a Starbucks. No, we were not immersing in a Starbucks. Thank you, Abby. That would be awkward. That would be awkward. Um, <laughs> no. But we we were founded as an organization, just kind of like wherever we could find a spot to sit and and call people and and email. Um, but eventually, this project that borrowed uh, an or an existing mikvah, but trained volunteers to use that mikvah for new and creative purposes, and also for ancient purposes. Um, that organization was eventually absorbed into the JCC Manhattan, and so. One of the ways I think about, and that's a, a micro way to answer a bigger question, which is like, what's going to happen, right? Like, why are all these, okay, people are creating new organizations. On one foot, I would say um, that every legacy organization, not only Jewish, is struggling with trust. Mm -hmm. That trust is the most valued commodity, the most valued thing that is broken in this country right now, I would say. And that goes for the government and that goes for Jewish life and that goes for institutional life and public education. And this isn't only from a progressive because I am a progressive and I am speaking always from a progressive mindset, but also from a conservative mindset. Trust is the biggest challenge I think that we have in this country right now. Can and you explain I, it in a, in a Jewish frame? I'm not sure everyone's going to know what you mean. Yeah. So I think there's a challenge trusting legacy institution. I think there is an, a lack of interest in, um, for not only for millennials and Gen Z and whoever is next. I, I always forget, I guess, alpha. My oldest, my youngest kids are alphas, I guess, but I don't want them to know that. That um, sounds cool. Yeah, it sounds too cool. Like we're the alpha. I'm the alpha. I'm the grown up. Um, but anyway, um, I think there is a deep lack of trust in the legacy, the Jew, the legacy Jewish institutions, and um, and some of it is deserved, in my opinion, that they have let people down. 
And some of it is just part of the ether and part of the zeitgeist right now of just saying, what are the ways I can create things in my living room that don't need um, an expert to help me with, right? And so exactly that challenge is um, on our website at belovedgarden.org. You can go to our story and, and you can hear me and you can hear what I'm about, read what I'm about to say, which is that um, you use the words and I couldn't agree more, Abby. Like, I think there's a, there's a DIY Jewish life that is not necessarily, in my opinion, um, sustainable and communal enough yet, because we know that Jewish communities they don't just serve 20s and 30s in we we grow up i just turned 40 i'm in the you know whatever i'm in the, I'm, i don't know where i am jewish life wise and i have two three young kids so it's like and so um and so i think diy might not be sustainable in terms of communally eventually you don't just need shabbat dinners in your living room eventually you need more than that in your jewish life and eventually, God willing, all of us would look up and say, I can't do it all myself. That's the opposite of Jewish life. That's the opposite of Judaism, right? right. To say, I am the beginning and the end of what Judaism has to say. I mean, that my needs trump any other Jewish needs? No, of course not. Um, so that's one challenge, I think, with DIY. And then I shared about the challenge with legacy, about trust, I think. That is the, one of the biggest pieces. Um, and, and so I think what Beloved is trying to do, and, and we haven't gotten there yet, but I hope that we can be the in-between, can be an in-between, I should say, so that it's not just, um, so that yes, some spiritual leaders are making things, making up communities, but that they become rooted and that they get, they, they, they become uh, something that people can go to that's outside of their living room. And, and, that lasts. and that lasts. I mean, you're also talking about it lasting or you're not talking about it lasting. Well, I was going to say, eventually my children will reject it as too legacy. I mean, honestly, honestly, my son, my, I mean, my oldest child, my, they're, they're um, non-binary. And they um, said to me, mom, I want my, I want my B mitzvah at a, at a synagogue, you know, I'm not a beloved Jew. I just want synagogue. And I was like, what's a beloved Where did Jew? I go wrong? I know. No, I was like, no, it was no. exactly appropriate because right. it was like, you're rejecting the Judaism I taught you for your own Judaism. My job here is done. That's right. yeah. That's, that's the fifth commandment. Honor your mother and father is to reject what your mother <laughs> exactly. and father did. Right. Um, so just very practically, Sarah, so people listening can understand like, Yes. What happens when someone engages, they go to your website and they say they yes. want this or they want to be part of a cohort or they want to support it. They want to support yes. that there are these, you know, maybe it's past their time, but they love that there's going to be uh, all of these leaders kind of getting nourished. Like what, yes. what practically is going to happen to these leaders when they sign up with Beloved or they get accepted? So um, we are doing something a little bit different in terms of um, most, I think most Jewish organizations, which is that we're not, we're kind of being a little quiet about it and it's very word of mouth. And so if you haven't heard about it, I mean, I don't want to take all the credit and say it's on purpose <laughs> because of course we do want people to know that this is possible. And that, however, we're not out there public, publicizing, oh, these people got into our fellowship and this cohort, because what we really want is for self-selected people to be mm. self-selected about the people who want to come and be part of our cohorts. The people who are like, I, and, and it's a lot of, like I said, it's a lot of word of mouth. And mm. so as it grows, there's more people who know about it and there's a lot more word of mouth. This is how we grew Immersed NYC. There was one cohort of volunteers who were in, in Hebrew, we say Mishugala Davar, which means crazy about a thing. They were crazy about creative mikvah or helping people to access the mikvah. And so they went out and they recruited their people to come to the mikvah, to volunteer at the mikvah. And that's how Immerse NYC grew. And that's how we're doing it at Beloved. 
So we've had, we are now this year in November, we just onboarded three new cohorts. We onboarded, um, we had so much interest for queer spiritual leaders that we created two cohorts. So we have two cohorts of spiritual leaders. And, and we also, which I find very exciting is that there's an organization, I don't know if you've spoken about it already, or you've spoken to Rabbi Sarah Horowitz, but called Yeshivat Maharat, which yes. is a they've Orthodox. Been on this, they've been on this broadcast. Yes. So, so for those who don't know, she's a, uh, the, the head of a, a seminary, an Orthodox seminary ordaining women as clergy. And um, we are um, supporting seven of these women who are going out on their own or con- considering going out on their own and um, to help support, um, to help the Orthodox, to help build some groundwork, to lay some groundwork that the Orthodox community can see that women can lead communities on their own, which hasn't been the case so far. Mm-hmm. Except for Rab- Rabbi Zassi Fruchter, who is leading the cohort. Um, so we are so yeah. So as um, as we grow, we're really re- this year we decided really it was because one or two queer spiritual leaders reached out to me and said, "Can you build a cohort that would be for spiritual leaders that we could be in an identity group because it would be safer and more nourishing?" And I said, mm-hmm. "Help me recruit leaders then." Um, and they did. And, and, and we found other people. So um, that's how we came to these three cohorts this year. Um, and we, next year, we're going to do a cohort that is people who are focused on not environmental justice, although they can be, but really focused on building communities where awe of nature and is embedded into the community. Um, and there are many spiritual leaders, Jewish spiritual leaders out there that are doing that already. And we're going to recruit them for our, for one of our cohorts next year. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to stop your second. So I can imagine some of our, of our listeners or viewers saying, this feels kind of like far out Judaism. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've listened to you so much where sort of the language of spirituality comes so naturally to you. Uh And it's not, it's not just that you talk about it. It's that you kind of demand it of, (laughs) of your, of your Jewish life and engagement. It's like, if it's not going to kind of really, you know, have sort of weight and ethics and consequences and morality and, and, and frankly, connection yeah. to, to, hu- to other human beings, I'm, I'm kind of out. Like, yeah. but you're a rabbi and you're ordained and you have the language, you know, you have the ancient tools. Yeah. So can you just, you know, for those who are saying, okay, this is not, this is like, this is for the kids kind of thing. <laughs> How do you kind of help us also see or that this is actually going to be everyone's Judaism in some way? Yeah. So I that's a great question, Abby. I really appreciate that question because it helps me think about how how everyone can understand this, um, the work we're doing. So what I want to say is one of the important pieces, uh, I, the most important value at Beloved, we have seven values and they're on our website very clearly. But the most, the, the, the number one value is listening. Mm. And so the way we, that we encourage our Beloved, our, the spiritual leaders that work with us to design their communities is to go out and listen to the people in their communities and build what they need. And, um, and I was just teaching a class yesterday to the leaders about this you also have to need it as a leader, mm. right? And so if you have that beautiful mashup of what you know people need because you have asked them explicitly and what you, you can't meet all people's needs all the time, but you understand what I'm saying. And then your need for deep spiritual or communal engagement, then that's how we learn how to create this next generation of Jewish life. But when I say next generation, I don't mean it's just for the next generation. Another Mm -hmm. thing that's really important for our communities is that it's intergenerational. It's that we're not only talking to 25 year olds who get to design whatever they want because they don't have as many often as many responsibilities or obligations and they can explore. Our communities are 
built on people who come and say, this is what I need. And that has, has by and large been multi-generational. So we're serving young people. Um, we're serving the 20s and 30s or whatever we want to say, uh, younger people. And we're serving families and we're serving. And when we say families, what we hear often is the parents need nourishment right? Mm. It's not only for children, right? Like Judaism is so expansive and the parents need so much nourishment too. So that's a lot of what we do. So those are people in their thirties, forties, fifties. And then we, we, some more than others of our communities are really also serving people who are empty nesters or who never had children or all different kinds of demographics. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that one of our um, beloveds in the Southwest is um, thinking about building a community just for people in their 40s and 50s, right? Like, have you heard of that? I don't know. I just feel like it's so uncommon. And I think there is a real desire to meet the needs of the people that are right in front of us. And then, um, again, with the layers of word of mouth, then they'll tell their friends. And their friends are not only in their age demographic, hopefully, and then they'll tell their friends and their parents and their grandparents and their children. And so that's how our communities okay. grow. On the website, you write, every one of us is beloved, worthy of divine accompaniment. We express belovedness with each other by emulating the Shahina and accompanying and supporting one another through our complex lives of joy and sorrow, triumph and trial, exile and homecoming. It's beautiful, but I want to unpack it a little bit. Sure. When you, you say every one of us is worthy of divine accompaniment. What do you mean by that? Okay. Um, so let me tell you a story. Um, I am a birth doula and I don't practice anymore, but a birth doula is a person who is with a laboring person and um, accompanies them through the birth, but it does not have a medical degree. And the job of a doula is to listen, care, bring ice chips, put your hands on, help the person move around so that birth is easier, um, support the partner, anything that's not medical that's needed. And when I was trained as a doula, I heard this beautiful story, which is that um, the doula is an ancient practice. But it has um, come back in, in the 60s, 70s, and to, till, till, till today. And the way it came back was there was some, someone doing a research study at a hospital. And that person asked if they could be in the room of the person who was delivering, um, not touch them, not speak to them, not interact with them at all, just be in the room and take notes. That's it in the corner. And what was discovered by this hospital was that the births, there were better outcomes for the mothers and babies of uh, in, when this person was in the room with them, not speaking to them, not helping them in any way, just standing there and witnessing them, which I call accompaniment. Hmm. And so I, I was, have been inspired by that story for years with the idea that you don't have to solve other people's problems and you don't have to control other people. And, um, and you don't have to bring joy to people all the time, but what we need in our, in our sacred communities is accompaniers. And as it says on, on the website and as it says, in, but not only on the website from the Talmud, <laughs> as it says in the Talmud, um, when we were exiled, when the Jewish people were exiled from the land, God sent the Shlina, God's divine presence, after us in exile. And the Shlina's job was not to make our lives less painful and to tell us everything's going to be okay. And um, and and our, the Shlina's job was to sit next to us. The Shlina's job was to accompany us in exile and, and help us recognize that we are worthy of God's divine love, even when we are not in the land. And we needed to learn that at that moment. And mm -hmm. so that's what I believe so deeply about what a Jewish community can be. 
is that we can be accompanying each other. And that is a real big difference, I think. I mean, not always, but a difference um, from the reason that synagogues were founded, you know, in the 50s, it was a different life and it was a different reason and there was a different need. And now I think there is a deep demand um, for people to have accompaniment. Um, There's a, a, people don't live close to their families. There's a real challenge to the nuclear family right now. Not everyone has children, that's for sure. Not everyone wants to be close to their, you know, close to their parents. Um, There's so, you know, there's so many, not everyone is partnered, not everyone. There's so many reasons why we need accompaniment and we need community in a different way than than we might um, have in the past, or it's just going to look different. And so that's what I think of when I think of divine accompaniment is us emulating what God is really doing for us. I love that. And it also makes me think of how we don't leave someone who's passed Mm, even into their final, their final journey. Uh, Sarah Loria, it's so good to talk to you. I could, I wish we had another hour, but I hope people will, even though it's still hush hush a little bit, you don't necessarily need us. Um, no, I, want- I need you. No, no, no. Okay. Um, just tell everyone where they can at least find out more. Just uh, yeah. say the website again. Belovedgarden.org. Wonderful. Thank you again, Sarah Luria, for this great conversation. And to all of you for joining us on In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. See you next time. <laughs>